Yes, guys. So let's talk about the first standard that is India's one. What does the standard deal with? Guys, remember this standard is a very peculiar standard because this does not have a corresponding accounting standard. Now, unfortunately, you might find ICA very strangely comparing your AS1 and India's one, but both are completely unrelated. I'll tell you why they are unrelated. Remember, number one, AS1 was dealing with disclosure of accounting policies, while India's one talks about presentation of financial statements. Your financial statements cover not just your disclosures and notes to accounts, but it covers your balance sheet, your statement of profitability, statement of changes in equity, your cash flows, and finally your notes to accounts. Within notes to accounts, one of the part is disclosure of accounting policies. So I can put it like this, that your AS1 was a very, very small, tiny part of what we have today in the form of India's one. So India's one has a much larger ambit. Now, what is the significance of India's one? Is India's one so significant? Let me understand. See, in simple sense, I can put it like this, that there was no standard, which was, there was no standard, which was particularly dealing with presentation of financial statements. That means if I talk about a particular organization, they could have presented their financial statements in any, any format. You could have started with equity and liability, equity and liability. Some enterprises could have started with assets. They could have presented non-current assets before. Some people might not even give you a bifurcation between current assets and non-current assets. I do a lot of audits and when we come across tax audits related to partnership entities, we don't even create a particular format also. All that we do is dump everything into one shot. But that is where India's one has laid some significance. Because India's one comes up and gives you a draft of what could be the presentation under uh, the India's. Now you will say, sir, India's is only applicable to company form of organization. Company's financial statement should be presented as per Schedule 3 of Companies Act. Then why India's one all over again? I agree. I agree that Schedule 3 is definitely the more comprehensive presentation of financial statements provided to the companies and the companies need to comply with this particular uh, schedule of the Companies Act. So, but however, you need to understand today's date, India's is only applicable to companies. But sooner or later, you will observe that India's will be applicable to non-corporate entities as well. We are going with the phase-wise adoption. We have only come across four phases which is ending on 2019 itself. So as the years progress, we will find that India's is now applicable to multiple entities where even probably the non-corporate entities will come into the ambit. Once the non-corporate entities come into the ambit, now you are moving out other than the companies. Companies have schedule three, very good, super good, comprehensive schedule for presentation of financial statement. Can you name a similar schedule given under partnership act? Can you give a similar schedule given for proprietorship concern can you have a similar schedule for corporate societies nothing you have banking you have a separate format of financial statements insurance you have a separate format of financial statements both of which you have covered in your ca inter right or your ipcc then comes your companies where you have schedule 3 but what about other format of organization what about other bodies they should also present financial statements in a particular format. Now, where is that particular format? Nothing is given. That is the reason why India's one was introduced. India's one does not give you a particular format, but will at least give you the minimum contents to be presented in financial statements. I'll repeat. I said India's one does not comprehensively give you the presentation format, but it will give you only the minimum contents in financial statements. That means any enterprise presenting its financial statements as per India's should have this minimum contents as prescribed by India's one. So therefore India's one in today's regime becomes even more important than what it was before because India's one on today's date is trying to bring out the minimum requirements in presentation of financial statements under India's. So therefore today's day standing on the day of 2021 I might not find the standard to be very, very relevant because you would come up and say today this India's is only applicable to companies where the Companies Act already has prescribed Schedule 3. Why do I need this standard? 
But remember, there will be an increasing significance to the standard once India starts applica applicable to non-corporate entities as well. So therefore, let's try to understand what is this minimum content he is talking about and what is other discussions which are forming part of your India's one. Yes, guys. So your India's one. What it says is Schedule 3 prescribes a rigid reporting format for a company. Then what is India's one talking? It prescribes minimum reporting requirements in presentation of financial statements for any non-corporate entity. Any corporate entity or a company form of organization will continue to follow Schedule 3. But any other form of enterprise, once it comes into the ambit of India's, has to present its financial statements with the minimum contents prescribed under India's one. The first thing which flashes into my head when I talk about India's one is a statement called as explicit unreserved statement of compliance. What is this explicit unreserved statement of compliance and what is the significance of this paragraph? Okay, this is the first time incorporation of this explicit unreserved statement and which has to be applied even by companies who are following schedule three. What is this? This is a statement given by the management. The management of an enterprise comes out with a statement saying that they have complied with every India's applicable to the enterprise and every paragraph of that India's which is applicable to the enterprise. Therefore, he is giving an explicit statement which is no reservation. Reservation in the sense that means exception to this paragraph I have applied the entire thing. Nothing like that. So I'm saying that an explicit unreserved statement of compliance should be made by the management and should be disclosed in your notes to accounts of financial statements. So what does the management give? The management says the financial statements have, which have been presented have been in compliance with every India's applicable and every paragraph of such India's applicable to the enterprise. This is called as explicit unreserved statement of compliance. Who gives? Management gives. Where do they disclose? In their notes to accounts, they disclose this explicit statement saying that they have complied with every India's and every paragraph of India's which is applicable to the enterprise in preparation and presentation of its financial statements. Clear? So let's read through what it says. Management should provide an explicit disclosure in notes to accounts for an unreserved compliance to the requirements under India's. Management can depart from the compliance. See, whenever a non-compliance is coming up, don't assume that non-compliance is crime. The management is not committing any crime for non-compliance. So if they depart from any non-compliance to the uh, non-compliance to any provisions of India's, if it conflicts with the objective of the financial state, that means though I give an unreserved, uh, unreserved statement of compliance in the notes to accounts, I'm saying that the management can depart from the compliance to a particular provisions of India's if they conflict, if they are having a problem with the objective of financial state. I think, let's say I have a borrowing or let's say I have a billing, a data from a particular country which is facing severe inflation. Severe inflation is being observed by such company to whom I have sold goods to. I have denominated the sale in the currency of the receiver or the customer. So according to your India's 21, I have to present the financial statements, sorry, at the time of presenting of financial statements, such foreign currency debtors have to be restated using the closing rate. But I said severe inflation is there and I'm expecting it to normalize by the time the settlement happens. So let's say today, the rate of uh, that currency is let's say about 40 rupees per rupee. Sorry, 40 currency per rupee. But that is on severe hyperinflation case. At some point of time, I am assuming that by the time the settlement happens, it will come down to 15 rupees or 16 rupees, uh, uh, you know, per that foreign currency. So what will happen? Instead of reporting at 40 in compliance to India's 21, the management will come up with a statement saying that it looks unreal. It looks unrealistic to measure my customer at that rate because I know that country is suffering from hyperinflation. Therefore, I assume 
that the settlement could happen somewhere between 15 to 16 rupees. Therefore, instead of translating at 40 rupees using the closing rate, I will give them the translation at 15 rupees or 16 rupees, saying that it is a probable rate at which that settlement could occur. Therefore, in some situations, the enterprise is entitled to depart from the compliance to Indias if it conflicts with the objective of financial statements. Objective, objective, you are talking so many times. What is your objective of financial statements? My objective of a financial statements is to present a true and fair view. Is to present a true and fair view of the affairs of the enterprise. A true and fair view of the affairs of the enterprise is the objective of presenting financial state. Financial statements should be reliable and relevant. Reliable because the figures presented in the financial statement should be relied can be relied upon. Relevant. It has to be relevant to make sure that the user of the financial statement is making an economic decision making or a suitable decision making process. So that, that is the reason why when we say there is a departure, departure is never a crime. You can depart from compliance to Indias even after giving an explicit unreserved statement of compliance if it, or if it conflicts with the objective of financial statements. So let's move further. What is the objective? Second guys. Look at this. What are the disclosure requirements? Whenever I present the disclosures or when I present the financial statements, my general disclosures are that the financial statements present a true and fair view and there's an ex explicit unreserved statement of compliance to the Indias given by the management. But if in case, if in case compliance to certain, certain provisions of the Indias are conflicting with the objective of presenting a true and fair view, I can depart. Depart means there is a non-compliance to a particular paragraph of the Indias. In such case, where there is a departure from Indias, I should first disclose what is the title of the Indias. What is the particular paragraphs of the Indias which I am not complying with? What is the reason for the non-compliance? And finally, what is the quantifiable effect of departure from Indias? If I complied with the provisions of Indias, then the value of the debtors would be presented at this number. But since I am departing from the compliance and I am presenting debtors at this value, then the difference is appearing in such manner. So this is quantifiable effect of a departure from Indias. So what am I saying? In general sense, for any financial statements, I have to present that my financial statements are presenting a true and fair view. And in preparation and presentation of financial statements, the management have complied with every Indias applicable, explicit, unreserved statement of compliance to Indias. However, if there can be a departure from compliance, or there can be a non-compliance to certain paragraphs of Indias if it conflicts with the objective of financial statements to present a true and fair view. If there is a departure as such, if there is a non-compliance as such, then the disclosures which are necessary to be done are name of the Indias, the paragraph of the Indias which is not complied with, what is the reasons for your non-compliance or departure and finally, what is the quantifiable effect of the non-compliance to Indias. If I would have complied with the Indias, then this could be the value. Since I'm not complying, this is the value. The difference of both is the quantifiable effect. If you remember AS1, AS1 also told you the same thing. You have to make sure that all the financial statements are prepared in compliance to accounting standards. If the particular standard is not complied with, then you have to give the name of the standard, reason for non-compliance, and quantifiable effect of non-compliance, if quantifiable effect cannot be identified, at least mention that the quantifiable effect cannot be identified. That last part, if it is impractical to present the quantifiable effect, then disclose the fact that paragraph is not a part of India's one. What is the significant impact of that? Is that a significant impact which is going to happen? Yes. Because it makes a compulsion on the enterprise to present the quantifiable effect. 
they cannot say that the quantifiable effect is impractical to identify. AS1 was very lenient. He was more lenient saying that it's okay. Even if you have non-complied with it, then and you cannot identify the quantifiable effect, you can at least disclose the fact that the quantifiable effect is impractical to identify. But India's one did not give any such lenience. He said compulsory, if there is a non-compliance, you need to specify what is the quantifiable effect of the departure or non-compliance to the standard. Clear? So it is significantly a much more rigid standard, not as lenient as what AS1 was talking about. Clear? Now, what is the frequency of reporting? Like we always know, it should be at least done once annually. You have to at least make a presentation of financial statements annually. Remember, there was no such restriction under your previous accounting standards. Your previous IGAP never told you what is the frequency of report. So in days one is coming up and saying that you should present the financial statements at least once annually. At the same time, he said a shorter or a longer period can be considered if there is a change in the reporting date. What is the change in reporting date and where else do we come across this concept? I'll tell you. We will come across this concept somewhere, somewhere else as well. So whenever I have, let's say, your enterprise X is presenting the financial statements starting from 1st April to 31st March every year. While let's say Y, entity Y, is following a calendar year, presenting its financial statements from 31st March to 30, 31st January to 31st December every year. Let's say in this case, X has acquired majority shareholding in Y. Immediately, I will understand that there is a parent or a holding company and subsidiary relationship which is established. To facilitate consolidation, to facilitate consolidation, let's say this occurred in 2000. This acquisition was affected. So for that year, Y Limited has changed its reporting date. So Y Limited has changed its reporting date. Or reporting period. And it shall now follow. financial year instead of calendar year. Therefore, in that year of 2021, therefore, in 2020-21, they presented 15 months financials. which is starting from 1st January 2020 instead of ending it on 31st of December 2020 they have extended it to 31st of March 2020 21. So I am saying they did not consider 31st of December 2020 but they continued to report up to 31st March 2021 so as to make the financial statements in line with the parent enterprise to facilitate consolidation. In such case, you will observe that uh, the concept of reporting a financial statements annually is being broken. It has not been complied with. So that is the reason why the standard comes out with a statement to say that sometimes there, a shorter or a longer period can be considered if there is a change in the reporting date. But 
whenever there is a change in the reporting date and you are presenting a shorter or a longer period than a financial year or an accounting year, in such cases, you have to first disclose the fact that there is a change in reporting date. Number two, there should be a reason for a change in the reporting date. Number three, the fact that the current reporting period cannot be compared with the corresponding previous period. What is this current reporting period cannot be compared with the previous reporting period? Guys, for this year, what is the comparative? My previous year, what is my previous year? 1st Jan 2019 up to 31st of December 2019. If you observe, this is for a period of 15 months, while the previous year comparative was only for Comparative is only for 12 months. Can you compare like this? Absolutely no. That's why he is saying that you also have to notify the fact that the previous period, that is the comparative period presented, is only for 12 months and you cannot compare with the current reporting period of 15 months and this is only a short term phenomenon. So this is exactly what we are saying. So if you go back to the paragraph, he says, you have to disclose the reason along with the fact that there is a change in the reporting date and at the same time also report that also report a fact that the current period which you have presented that is for 15 months is not comparable with the previous reporting period of just 12 months clear so this is my disclosure requirement whenever you are presenting a financial statement for a period shorter or longer than one financial year or one accounting period clear so my reporting should be done at least once annually however you can choose a shorter or longer period in case there is a change in the reporting date and the fact and the reason of the change in reporting date should be mentioned along with disclosing a fact that your current reporting period which is drafted for a shorter or a longer period is not comparable with my corresponding previous period clear What is the minimum content prescribed by India's one? Like I told you, India's one only prescribes the minimum contents to be presented in the financial statements. Though it heading says presentation of financial statements, the more appropriate heading would be minimum contents in presentation of financial statements. Same way, he will give you the minimum contents in the form and content uh, form of the financial statement. So financial statement should bare minimum include a balance sheet, a statement of profitability which includes two parts p and and OCI, a statement of cash flow which we deal as per India 7, a statement of changes in equity, an additional statement compared to what we had under IGAP and lastly notes to accounts. These are the five basic minimum contents to be presented within the financial statements clear at the same time while presenting financial statements certain prominent disclosures should be made what is the prominent disclosure and why should they be made a prominent disclosure in presentation of financial statements will help the user understand what is being presented to him number one name of the reporting entity without having a name ultimately it is useless to even present number two the user also should be communicated whether the financial statements were drafted on a standalone basis or a consolidated basis number three i should also present the reporting date and the reporting period i should be presenting my reporting date along with my reporting period because the reporting date and reporting period will understand will help me understand whether the financial statements are presented for one full year or a longer period or a shorter period. Number four, what is the currency in which the reporting has occurred? Now, I have compared Apple figures with Reliance figures. Reliance in rupee, Apple in dollars. Comparable? No. So if I remove the currency from there, ultimately I do not know whether I can compare them or not. That is the reason why a reporting currency should also be disclosed. And don't forget the most important one, which we forget even when we are solving questions, is the level of rounding off. Sometimes the question is given in lakhs and we forgot to mention that 
the rupees are in lakhs. We continue to solve the entire problem, but understand the one small thing that you forgot is all to mention that statement that all rupees are in lakhs. Every time you solve a problem, please remember this that even in your solving of a problem, this last point, the level of rounding off also should be mentioned. So what am I saying? Name of the reporting enterprise. What is the, uh, whether it is being drafted on a standalone basis or on a consolidated basis. What is the reporting date and the reporting period? Reporting currency in which the financial statements are prepared. And finally, what is the level of rounding off? Guys, level of rounding off is given under Companies Act 2013 as well. Okay, where he says if your turnover is less than 100 crores, then you can present to the extent of if your turnover is less than 100 crores, then you can round off in thousands, in lakhs, or in millions. But if your turnover is greater than 100 crores, then in such cases, your round off can be in lakhs, in millions, or in crores. In lakhs, in millions, or in crores, or if you want, you can present an absolute number also. But remember, presenting an absolute number, having an enterprise of turnover of more than 100 crores would not make the financial statements reliable and relevant. Since I have to make sure that the financial statements are reliable and relevant, I have to choose an appropriate rounding off. Clear? If my turnover is in lakhs and if I, and if I round off in crores, then I'll have to present the turnover as 0.00. .00. Not necessary. That's why appropriate level of rounding off is supposed to be identified by the management. So what am I saying? Minimum disclosures to be presented in financial statements or minimum statements to be presented as a part of financial statements is their balance sheet, statement of profitability, statement of cash flow, statement of changes in equity, and finally your notes to accounts. Prominent disclosures to be presented on the face of the financial statements is the name of the reporting enterprise, whether the financial statements are presented on a standalone or a consolidated basis, what is the reporting date or reporting period, what is the level of rounding off, and what is the reporting currency. Five contents, five prominent disclosures are necessary to be disclosed as a part of India's part. Clear? Now let's come to the balance sheet presentation. So from here on, our discussion will go on in what is the content, minimum content in the balance sheet, minimum content in statement of profitability, minimum content in statement of changes in equity, minimum content in notes to accounts. Remember, I will not touch the concept of presentation of cash flows because your statement of cash flows has a separate standard altogether that is India 7. Clear? 